It's Subverted Tropes, a podcast about movies, featuring your hosts, Daniel Spencer and Kate Harlow. Welcome to another episode of Subverted Tropes. I'm Dan. I'm Kate. And um, this is our first recording of 2018, isn't it? Yeah, first of the new year. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Happy Collaborateen. Happy Collaborateen, trademark. Trademark Big my Giant brother, Head my Productions. Brother. Yeah. My brother, my brother, and me. And Big Giant Head Productions. We're both a little sick. We are. We're both not feeling top of the line. So uh, Sorry, guys. You might hear some more sniffles and We're stuff. We're trying. We are working through it. Mm-hmm. So on on subverted tropes, if you're new to the show, we like to talk about movies. Mm-hmm. One of us will do some research into the production. Usually Dan. Usually me. Uh, we'll talk about it. We'll watch it, and then we'll come back and we'll talk about some of the tropes in the movie. Mm-hmm. It's a lot of fun. It is fun. Is that the? We really need to figure out that description because we really do. I'm really bad really at describing work. this. Because in my mind, it's like, oh, it's another podcast where people talk about movies. There's a million of those. The we're we're is, the flavor. We're the, we're the Cajun seasoning. That's right. You're the hachi. I'm the machi. <laughs> You're the pepper, and I'm the salt. <laughs> yep. That's about right. Shall we get to today's episode? Yeah. All right. This whole month, with the exception of uh, Scrooge that we released on the first, mm-hmm. uh, this whole month, we're going to be talking about classic musicals. We're going to be starting off... With Meet Me in St. Louis. I'm very excited. I'm... I don't know this one at all. Very excited as well. This one, I haven't seen in a long time. Mm-hmm. It's good. It's got a few really like big songs that I'm mm-hmm. sure you'll hear. And you'll go, oh, it's from... That's... This mm-hmm. is from that. But it's, uh, it's just real great. Cool. Meet Me in St. Louis tells the story of basically a year in the life of a family in uh, St. Louis, Missouri. Mm-hmm. St. Louis, Missouri. As they prepare for the 1904 World's Fair. Ooh. It is based off of a collection of short stories written by uh, Sally Benson. Mm -hmm. Uh, She originally kind of had a collection of them called 5135 Kensington, which was the street address of their house. Oh. Uh, As they were like going to actually publish that, Mm -hmm. the publisher changed the name of it to Meet Me in St. Louis because the stories had already been optioned for this movie. So, the movie is based off of the collection of short stories that was originally named 5135 Kensington, but then changed to be based off of Meet Me in St. Louis. The title, based off the movie, based off the book. Nice. Okay. Not convoluted. Fine. Not at all. No. So, the director of this movie is uh, Vincent Minnelli, Mm -hmm. and he really loved the stories and wanted to do justice to Benson's childhood and really like hit the stories properly. So Mm -hmm. he consulted very heavily with Sally Benson to get exact details for the sets, the costumes, et cetera. Like she explained their house Mm -hmm. in great detail. She was on the set as they were putting everything together. She's like, no, that was a little, that was a couple inches over, like Mm -hmm. basically rebuilt her family's house. Wow. Um, But he was very dedicated to getting the specifics right. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the cast was actually all very, very impressed with it. it. It was an interesting dichotomy because he was interested in getting the details right, but didn't want her to write the script for it. It's based off of her short stories. She wrote a script, but, but um, Irving Brecher and... F- I knew it was going to be a man. I knew it. How did well, I know that? Irving Brecher worked with someone else, though. Mm-hmm. Also a man... Fred F. Finkelhoff. Yep. Which honestly, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna call this one now. Two white dudes. I I didn't look them up, but I have a feeling based on those names. Yeah. I'm gonna say. I'm just not convinced that Fred F. Finkelhoff isn't like three hamsters in a trench coat. It does not sound like a real name. Hello, I'm Fred F. Finkelhoff? No, I mean in that in that era, I would believe, I would believe that name. So Roger Edens was put in charge of the musical score for the film, mm-hmm. uh, adapting several songs from the time period in which the movie was set, mm-hmm. and worked with Hugh Martin and Ralph Blaine to write the original songs for the movie. 
Uh, we'll talk about the music later. It's a very big mm-hmm. part of the movie, obviously. Let's get into the cast. Yes. Uh, the star of the movie is a 21-year-old Judy Garland oh. playing the young Esther. She's the second oldest daughter of the Smith family and the primary focus of the film. Mm-hmm. She's in love with John Druitt, played by Tom Drake. Mm-hmm. Leon Ames and Mary Astor play the parents of the family, and the youngest daughter steals every scene that she's in, played by Margaret O'Brien, who's actually still making movies. Oh, wow. I'm not, I don't know how good those are, considering two of the most recent ones were, and I'm, I'm going off of the, these are legitimate titles on her IMDb page. Mm-hmm. Elf Sparkle meets Christmas the Horse. That sounds like a Hallmark original if I've heard one. Halloween Pussy Trap Kill Kill. That sounds more like a sci-fi original. Yep, 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 yep. Halloween Pussy Trap Kill Kill involves a uh, Pussy Riot style band. Which I assume this elderly woman was the lead of. I can only hope so. Mm -hmm. Christopher Lee style. Mm -hmm. Not that Christopher Lee was in a Pussy Riot band, but Christopher Lee was fronting a heavy metal band up to the point where he died. Mm -hmm. It was amazing. But anyway, she was in a lot of movies before this as various children. Uh, She was a very prolific child actor and very talented, as you'll see in this movie. Mm -hmm. She actually got a special Oscar for Best Child Actor. Oh, They basically just created just for her to give to her for her performance in this movie. Oh, Originally, her mother wanted her to be paid more Mm -hmm. than she was being paid. So the studio was like, well, no, we're going to go with this actress instead, who was the daughter of one of the lighting workers on the set. Mm -hmm. And then uh, they changed their minds and cast Margaret O'Brien again. Mm -hmm. And the lighting guy went from gruntled to disgruntled. I'm shocked. And tried to drop a heavy spotlight on Margaret O'Brien. That should be surprising, but like every every script ever that's had a disgruntled lighting guy written into it involves somebody dropping a heavy spotlight. On that's somebody. a very good so, point. Uh, it started somewhere. Yep. So he was taken away and put into a mental institution for trying to harm a child. I mean, that's probably the best case scenario for him. Yeah. Because... I mean, it's not necessarily a mentally ill... Th- I mean, it's it's a mentally ill thing to do, but, like, people make terrible choices all the time and don't wind up in mental hospitals. This is very true. O'Brien was not phased. <laughs> at all. Because she was a child and therefore immortal in her own eyes. Yes. She, I mean, she didn't let anything phase her. For her emotional... I've got a couple nieces like that. Yes. Yes, you do. <laughs> For her emotional scenes, she would have her mother... This is great. Minnelli... Uh, recalled that her mother would like lean in and whisper something in her ear that would start her crying and then basically as soon as that scene was done her crying would stop Mm -hmm. and she would just be her happy little self again wow until one day when i don't know exactly what was going on but they like her mother was like she's just not talking to me Mm -hmm. so manella you're gonna have to tell her Mm mm-hmm that someone's going to go kill her dog. Oh, my God. And that is the way to get her to cry. Mm-hmm. He did not want to do it. Mm-hmm. But he's like, well, if this is the way it works, this is what happens. So he went and did it. And mm-hmm. she started crying. She shot the scene and skipped along at the end. Like, at the end, she just skipped off set. <laughs> she was a very happy, smiling, prank-pulling <laughs> little girl. Okay. Uh, she loved to like make minor changes to the set, mm-hmm. like moving around a couple of forks by a plate around the dinner table, so mm-hmm. that like one plate had three forks and one had you know only one or etc. Mm-hmm. Um, and just like making a lot of these small changes that would apparently drive the prop master insane. Mm. Uh, but there wasn't. And really then much he tried he to drop a spotlight it. on her. Then he tried to drop a spotlight. No, <laughs> mm-hmm. someone I forget who was like, yeah, I'm sure he just wanted to like shake her and tell her stop doing this. And yeah, of course, uh, it wasn't really a thing that he could do. Uh, so Judy Garland mm-hmm. was not very happy about this role. No. Um, she had kind of. She was 21, mm-hmm. and she didn't like the idea of playing someone, playing a a teenager Mm -hmm. and being cast as the girl next door. Mm -hmm. Uh, She kind of 
wanted to branch out more. Uh, but this film would introduce her to someone with whom she would have an incredible relationship, Dottie Ponadel, MGM makeup artist. Okay. So Garland showed Ponadel all the things that she did for her camera appearances, putting in like caps on her teeth, Mm -hmm. inserting rubber discs inside of her nostrils to change the shape of her nose. Ponadel was like, girl, you don't need any of that. Threw out all of that stuff. Uh, and said, you're a pretty girl. Let's see what we can do. Ponadel got to work on a more natural makeup for Garland, and it worked for her. Mm-hmm. And Judy Garland absolutely loved it. She felt more confident on set. She Aww. was just very, like... She was a lot happier on set. Nice. And after that, any MGM studio movie that Judy Garland did, she insisted... That uh, Ponadel was her makeup artist. Get you a Ponadel. Get you a Ponadel. At first, Judy Garland didn't actually take the movie very seriously. She was reading her lines. So uh, Vincent Minnelli insisted on a lot of uh, rehearsals. Mm -hmm. And she would read her lines in a very flippant, kind of making fun of the script type of way. Until somebody tried to drop a spotlight on her. (laughs) Until Vincent Minnelli tried to drop a spotlight on her of truth. (laughs) No, he, no, I think Ponadel did that. <laughs> that's a good point. Uh, Manelli pulled her to the side and said, I want you to read your lines as if you mean every word. Mm-hmm. She did her best to improve, but it still wasn't really enough. Mm-hmm. Apparently she would, she locked herself in her trailer at one point, refusing to come out, and Arthur Freed, the, one of the producers, went in and talked to her, and she said that she didn't know what Manelli wanted. She felt like she couldn't act anymore. It was like she was really having a crisis. And uh, Arthur Freed said, look, Manelli knows what he's doing. He's going to take care of you. Trust him. And so uh, she and Manelli started to work very closely together mm-hmm. to, like, get. I just feel like, the, I feel like there has to be something missing to that story because there's a huge difference between, like, I'm not taking this seriously and I'm being very flippant and then somebody like asking you to take it seriously and then flipping out and having a serious crisis of conscience. So it was that like she, he asked her to take it seriously. She started trying to take it seriously and he still was not happy with what, how she was doing Mm. it. Um, but then they started working together and her stuff started improving and a love started to blossom. Ooh. And this is where Judy Garland first met Vincent Minnelli, and mm-hmm. they would go on to get married and have a child, Liza Minnelli. Everyone thinks this is an outro. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they actually went on their first date towards the end of shooting this movie. Nice. Which was super cute. So I want to talk about the music, but I think I want to wait until after we've watched it to get too into it. Uh, I will say at least the titular song, Meet Me in St. Louis, mm-hmm. uh, was not one written for the movie. It was adapted from the advertising for the 1904 World's Fair. Uh, I really wanted to just say advertising for the movie for the book. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that would have been great. Uh, but no, so they took a, like the limerick style poem for the advertisements and turned it into a song called Meet Me in St. Louis. Louis. Cool. Louis, Louis. Oh, Louis Louis in this movie? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm so excited. Uh, it's going to be great. Uh, you want to go watch it? Let's go watch it. Let's go watch it. And we're back. We're back. So what did you think? It was good. It was weird. It was weird? It was weird. How was it weird? I get, I don't know. I feel like the like the the focus was obviously the dynamic of the family, but I feel like it like was like awkwardly shoehorned in. It didn't really have a, a lot of a plot. No. Uh, and that was kind of the purpose of the movie. Okay. Was that it was just telling the story of a, a year in the life of this family. Okay. Which, you know, it's a little weird for, especially for that time, mm-hmm. uh, for a movie to not have a whole lot of plot. Yeah. I guess it had the plot of Judy Garland wants to get you know, engaged to boy next door. Older sister wants to get proposed to by her boyfriend. Mm-hmm. Family's going to move to New York and that's going to destroy everything type stuff. Yeah. But. I guess I just have, I liked it. It was 
sweet, but it's like the some of the ju- stuff just kind of felt like awkwardly peppered in. Yeah. Like Tootie's whole character. While entertaining and adorable. I love the character of Tootie. Yeah, but she feels like she's supposed to be in a whole different movie. Yeah, she doesn't really advance the plot along with the exception of when she fell off the in the Halloween scene mm-hmm. when she hurt herself and initially blamed it on John yeah. Stewart for no reason. Yeah. Uh, she doesn't really advance the plot much. but No, and she gets a lot of screen time and attention and very high billing despite not actually adding that much. But she's so entertaining. Like, she does such a fun job. I love her so much. <laughs> and I understand if you don't. That's fine. Yeah. I just absolutely loved her character, if not just for, I mean, the the I Was Drunk Last Night, Dear Mother song, mm-hmm. and the, the blood spurted out three feet, and like being just diabolical. I mean, she reminds me of uh, former guest on this show, Jenny Spencer, when Jenny was a child, mm-hmm. so much. Like, there, it's uncanny. I mean, yeah, I get, I get that. Did I ever tell you about Jenny's uh, imaginary friend no. when she was a kid Mm-mm. named Hambone? No. He was a 10 foot tall man who got murdered. Okay. By his friends. Okay. Uh, I don't remember all of it, but I remember he was very, very tall and was specifically was murdered, brutally murdered. Um, Poor Hambone. Imaginary friend. Yeah. Well, I mean, he was cool, apparently. <laughs> he was friends with Jenny. Okay. But <laughs> mm-hmm. I feel like that's totally in line with what Tootie would yeah. have as an imaginary friend. Probably. But I totally see what you mean as well, though. Mm-hmm. So uh, let's talk about the music. Mm-hmm. So we've got three songs particularly that were like, Big, so I guess when the the movie came out, two songs that were big hits, and then now two songs that have staying power. Mm -hmm. One of those songs is different. Mm -hmm. So of course the movie, the song from the movie that has the most staying power of all of it Mm -hmm. was "Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas." Mm -hmm. Uh, This was the the song was written for this movie, Mm -hmm. uh, though it was significantly more depressing Mm -hmm. in this movie than it is now. Uh, yeah, and I believe you've mentioned that to me before, the, the yeah. changes in the lyrics. Yes. Um, the the line from today that we know as hang a shining star upon the highest bow mm-hmm. is originally, until then we'll have to muddle through somehow, mm. basically saying, it's Christmas right now, and that's awesome. Next year it's going to be Christmas again. From now until then, shit's going to suck. And we're going to have to make of it what we can. Fake it till you make it. Fake it till you make it. Christmas style. <laughs> whoop, 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 bum Christmas style. No, that's a, such a dated reference. Topical. 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 Originally, when it came out, You and I, the song that, uh, that I, this is one of my favorite numbers from the movie, which, mm-hmm. like, in years past when I watched it, I didn't give two shits about it. But, like, now watching it and seeing it as, like, the family has this big dramatic moment of, oh, we're going to move to New York and everyone's upset about it. Mm-hmm. And then the mother goes and starts playing on the piano and the father's like, oh, I haven't heard you play this in in years and goes up and starts singing and then like the whole family comes in and kind of resumes Mm -hmm. normal family things. It's a very touching moment. Mm -hmm. So that was really big when the movie originally came out. And fun fact, for that number, Leon Ames, who plays the father, that wasn't him singing. Okay. That was Arthur Freed, the producer of the movie, singing. He (laughs) and... uh, and so he also did a lot of writing music. Uh-huh. And spoiler alert, you're going to hear his name a lot in the next episode, too. Oh, yeah. But he and Nasio Herb Brown. That's quite a name. Yes. Arthur Freed and Nasio Herb Brown wrote a lot of music together. Mm-hmm. And they wrote a few of the songs for this movie. And so Arthur Freed dubbed himself over Leon Ames' voice, mm-hmm. uh, singing the song that he wrote and had a lot of, like, was very passionate about. 
and it's a great song. It's a is you and I. It's a very like it's a very sweet song about how no matter what happens, you and I will always be together. Mm-hmm. Just like you and me. Mo. Do I love you. I love you. Um, but then of course, in years. Later, you and I would sadly diminish in popularity, and uh, the trolley song would yes. become a lot more popular. <laughs> and it gets referenced or got referenced to what I haven't seen a, like a fresh reference to it in a long time, but it got referenced for a long time um, in pop culture stuff. Martin sings it in the talent audition when Mr. Burns is looking for an heir. There we go. I was I knew that <laughs> The Simpsons had some sort of reference to it. Of course, the uh, The Simpsons the origin like the the older seasons were so rich with pop culture references to things like Meet Me in St. Louis and Citizen Kane and the original Planet of the Apes and like it, they were really really rich storytellers. Yeah, a long time ago. So the it's the clang 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 went the trolley song, zing 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 went my heartstrings. From the moment I saw him, I tripped and fell. And I think I chipped a tooth. I think you're conflating. Shit. <laughs> Something along those lines. But, no, the trolley song is is mm-hmm. great, obviously. I like a lot of the music in this movie. Mm-hmm. And I like how a lot of it is presented as not in your standard musical of, like, we're just going to burst into song. Of, like, this is a video, like, this is a movie of people who are actually singing a lot of these songs Mm -hmm. like in context of the scene Mm -hmm. especially with the family like the opening scene of everyone kind of singing the meet me in st louis song yeah uh and you know a a few scenes like the party scene where they're all singing skip Mm -hmm. to my lou um where it's really got like this feel of these people are just singing not like Oh, it's a musical. It's a song and a musical. Yeah. And I really I really enjoy that personally. Yeah, no, I, I, stylistically I enjoyed it. Stylistically, I enjoy your face. Your face. Your 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 face? Your face. I don't know. Anyway. So that Halloween scene. Yeah. Uh is a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. It's weird. Yeah, it's weird. It's so weird. A lot AF. of hooliganism that went on in the nineteen hundreds. Mm-hmm. That I was unaware of. The 1900s. Like, the all of it. <laughs> well, I mean, the movie was set in 1903. What the early... time frame? Well, no, I mean, when you say the 1900s, uh, ostensibly, that could that could count up to 1997 was still part of the 1900s. All right. So then a lot of hooliganism went on in the, if, in the early 1900s, in the first decade of the 1900s. That's good. There, okay. Um... So that whole scene, like all of those shots were filmed from a lower perspective. Because mm-hmm. so, they were mostly children. Because it was mostly children. Yeah, exactly. They wanted to make it seem like it was being seen through the eyes of a child. Mm-hmm. Uh, which I think is a really cool idea. And yeah. uh, Tootie. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about Tootie. Yes. A little bit more. So like I said, I think she's very similar to how Jenny was as a child. Mm-hmm. Um, Jenny, I hope you don't mind all of these comparisons. Oh, she doesn't. She's well aware of all of these comparisons. <laughs> no, I'm sure she's aware of she... them, but does she need them being podcasted? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think she's fine with it. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, she had things, songs she would perform in front of people, uh, mm-hmm. oh, including yeah. I Was Drunk Last Night, Dear Mother. <laughs> um, but uh, so she was named... Uh, the, so Sally Benson herself had the nickname of Tootie. Uh-huh. Um, but it was actually her sister Agnes who did a lot of the things that Tootie does in this movie. Uh-huh. And there was actually a sequel planned to this movie. Mm-hmm. But never really got off the got off the ground. Uh-huh. Uh, the sequel was based off of real life events similar to this one mm-hmm. um, called Meet Me in Manhattan mm-hmm. because the family did move to New York. Ha-ha. <laughs> Uh, which I, f- I find hilarious. It's like, uh, the if there is really an identifiable plot, I guess one of the ones is the family not wanting to move to New York, and at the end it's like, we're not moving to New York. Spoiler, they did. <laughs> they moved to New York. So let's talk about the tropes. Um, Entire movie that doesn't pass the Bechdel test. Did it not pass the Bechdel test? No. I don't think so. Yeah, it did. Oh, the, ke- the ketchup. Yeah. That's it. 
No, I mean, technically, uh, there were scenes where the, like, like it, right before Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas, they weren't talking about boys. They were talking about the family moving okay, to in, in the but snowman. I, and okay, I would argue that if one of the characters is a child, it kind of changes the parameters a little bit. I mean, if we're looking strictly at face value, yes. But, like, with the exception of the discussion of the ketchup at the beginning, the adult or of age women almost exclusively were discussing men or being around for men or we need to move dinner because of men. Well, it, uh, it just. Oh, I'll, I'll give you like it. It definitely was a very focused on romantic situations and what women can do to be more appealing to men and to create romantic situations to create where romantic they are not without a doubt. Uh, definitely not great. Yeah. Also, I don't think there was a single person of color in this movie. Not a one. And that is an issue. Mm-hmm. There is the trope of, uh, I don't know this person. I've never met this person. I'm in love with them though. Ugh. I am so in love with this person. And the we'll have one slightly romantic moment of you helping me turn off the lights in the house. And you'll want to kiss me, but you won't. And that will make everything so romantic. So that when I get really mad because I think you hit my sister, I'm going to go hit you a lot. And then you'll forgive me when you realize it was all just a silly misunderstanding. I think we are to presume that there is a lot of other interactions between them as the time is going on. Some banging? No. No? No, I think probably more vigorous handshakes and awkwardness. Vigorous handshakes. And a lot of like doe-eyed bullshit. Yeah, it's probably a good point. Because it was like three months later. Mm -hmm. So... But still. But still. It's crazy. (laughs) What we see at face value, not a lot. No. Uh, There's the trope of um, the young boy dying at the very beginning of the movie. That happens in so (laughs) many movies. So we see a (laughs) cart, a horse-drawn cart. I didn't even notice it until you pointed it out. Horse-drawn cart. Of beer. Of beer. Of big casks of beer, which is great. Uh, two young children, what, like eight, maybe? No, more than that. I, like, maybe six, seven, eight max. Yeah, eight max. <laughs> and uh, these two boys kind of... Just chillaxing on... Chillaxing on a beer cart. On this beer cart. Much the way um, Tootie's hanging out on the ice cart. Right. For whatever reason, because this is how children learn trades. Uh, so, to be fair, uh, they did say that 2D was working on the ice cart. So, I think it's possible the boys were working on the beer cart. Okay. Uh, because child labor laws were different at that point. This is how um, children learn trades. This is how children learn trades. The they're two like boys kind of push each other. Yeah, they're like... roughhousing. And then one just flops over. He just goes limp. Just totally limp. And the other one's shoving him and He's like just not, dead just, weight. He's just dead weight. The kid is either dead or was getting high off his own supply and drunk off his ass. He might have been they, at the very back. They were sitting on like two slightly smaller casks, um, so maybe those were just personal. Like that's this is True, what you yeah. get for the day. It could have been table beer, which is that's like a thing. Yeah, it's like an under three percent beer. Okay, uh, which like in Germany they serve to kids of in they schools. Do. It's like this is the beer for your babies. Babies, <laughs> it's insane. But, it's insane, uh, but yeah, I love that trope. Happens all the time. Yeah, that's one of my favorite tropes. <laughs> uh, but no, the uh, um, uh, let's see. The, there's the trope of the the oldest sister of the family is in danger of becoming an old maid. She's very near nearly graduated high school, <laughs> and she still doesn't have anybody proposing to her. Yeah. Um, the there's also the trope of uh, the only person making money in this family is needing to make a decision to be able to get more money, and everybody is mad at him. Yeah, that's... Ugh. Also, the trope of the 
man is the breadwinner and the only one work. I mean, it's the 1900s, so whatever, but like, I mean, still an issue. I mean, in fairness, his wife was at home making him bottle upon bottle upon bottle of ketchup. That's a, that's a good With point. their housemaid lady. Their which, housemaid. Like, you would think that that would be her job. She is fantastic. She's a great character. I mean... I... Love the character of Katie in this movie. She's a stereotype, though. I mean, I'm honestly just... So, okay. It's a problem that there are no people of color, but, like, I'm glad that Katie wasn't being played by a person of color because it would have been that much more offensive. Agreed. Agreed. Nosy, older, busybody woman runs the entire household. Marjorie Maine, though, was hilarious. Uh, One of my... So, a line that my family will reference every so often, particularly my mom... Uh, was is at the towards the beginning of the movie when uh, Agnes comes in and asks about her cat, <laughs> and <laughs> Katie says, "Oh yeah, she was in my way earlier, so I kicked her down the stairs. I heard her spine crack on every step." God. I don't know why that's so funny. Like obviously, animal abuse not not funny, not funny, not cool, not a thing to do. But obviously, she didn't actually do it. She's like, "Your cat's right there." But I feel like you fine. haven't heard enough out of the character at that point to understand that that's sarcasm. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely something that like it gets better with repeat viewings mm-hmm. in terms of her sarcasm. Yeah, uh, but no, I I really love her. And another trope that we see is uh, like the the father or the grandfather in this case, the grandfather character uh, being very sweet and loving to uh one of his granddaughters who's fallen on who's who's going through an emotional rough time Mm -hmm. uh and i that is a trope that i personally absolutely love i I just find it so sweet and endearing and the grandfather is also just life goals let's be honest with the exception of how fucking high his pants are and how short (laughs) his tie is the man's got Lots of hats. Lots of amazing hats. I love all damn hats. He's hilarious. Mm-hmm. He speaks his mind. Uh, he's very sweet. And I just want to go back and say again, his hats, though. He has a lot of hats. He's got like a couple of different fedoras. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's got hats, the names of which I don't really know. I wish I did. Mm-hmm. I wish I was that level of classy. He's got a fez. Uh, that's what I meant, not fedoras. I meant fezes. He's got a couple of different fezes. Okay. I'm um, embarrassed that I said fedoras. He might have had a fedora. Well, I no, don't God, think you, no, it's too the, early. Yeah, yeah fedoras too were too they normal. He had a bunch of abnormal hats. Yeah, but I don't, he was I don't just have any more hat names. He was just great. Um. The whole a girl doesn't kiss a guy until they're until engaged. They're engaged. I'm just like times you, you, times have changed. You must keep the bloom on the flower. That's right. A boy doesn't want that. Yeah, it's it was it's, it's absurd. Weird. It's just times have changed so much. Yeah. No, things are, are very very much different. Um. There's the discussion when they're when they're confronted with the news that they're going to New York. Like, oh, what about the girls? Where they're they're going to be changing schools, and um, you know, R- Rose is going to want to go to college, and Esther's like, well, well, no, she might get she might get engaged. We've got we're working on straight. Like, no, bitch, go to college. Things are happening. She might need not need to go to college. Go to college. And where this is funny for me because I dropped out. Uh, but if I wanted to go, I could and I would. Damn it. Right. And John Truitt. When he's like, oh, let's get married. I don't have to go to college to be an engineer. I'll get a job and support you right. I'll just get a job and support you immediately. It's not a thing that could happen today. No. Uh, Which is funny because I didn't go to college. We say from our lovely home together. We do say from our lovely home together. And I think think we're doing pretty okay. Pretty doing okay, but... Pretty doing okay. Pretty doing okay. Hey, yeah. Oh. <laughs> we have a beautiful cat. We have a beautiful cat. She helps produce our show. She's producing right now. She is. She's great. I think she just heard the dead air there and gave us the death glare she of like did. no she dead gave air. Gave us a dirty look. No dead air on the podcast. The trope of hating basketball. Which it's I not also... a trope. That's just logic. The best tropes are logic, hun. <laughs> I don't know about that. I'll just go. But 
No, I do love the line of, I don't hate you, I just hate basketball. <laughs> Same. <laughs> just don't look. Here's the thing. I love sports. Hockey, football, awesome. College basketball is great. So I think the thing about it is that like that should have been a major warning. Like He knew that he had basketball practice. He also knew that he needed to get his tux for the dance that night that he had promised this woman that he was planning on proposing to. Clarification, his dad's tux. His dad's tux. But he didn't process through that. And I'm assuming... Like I like I don't know holiday hours were necessarily a thing so much then, or like they probably wouldn't have even been open on Christmas Eve. The whole thing is wrong. Um, but anyway, he didn't think of the room. Think like, oh, I either need to leave practice early, or I should double check, or I should go and see that it's done before I go to practice because it's really important to this woman that I want to propose to. <laughs> Foresight. He did not do a great job mm-hmm. of you know planning. Mm-hmm. I'm like that's a thing that's like important very for like and I know that because I'm not great at it that's why I value it so highly <laughs> <laughs> I mean I'm sure there's other tropes I'm sure there are but but I think we've hit the important ones I guess yeah. okay. so we've got a month full of classic musicals mm-hmm. uh, coming up we're going to be talking seven brides for seven brothers we got Singing in the Rain coming up with a very special guest on that one who has been mentioned previously in this podcast. It's true. Uh, and then we're going to be capping off the month with Chicago. Mm-hmm. What uh, The movie that I see is having reignited the modern musical. I would not argue that. I, I feel that. Uh, unless maybe we're going to count High School Musical. Get out. I just wanted to see your reaction to that. Uh, but yeah, so stay tuned for some really great musicals episodes. Um, but uh, for the meantime, we are, of course, Subverted Tropes. You can always find us on iTunes, Podbean, Stitcher, uh, really wherever you find your podcasts. YouTube. YouTube, even. If you, um, if you want to see a static image. If you do want to see a static image, uh, we're there. It's us. It's a great static image, though. That image is basically our logo, uh, which was made by the amazingly talented Gracie Boland. Mm-hmm. Uh, her Etsy is that crazy princess. Her Instagram is a fandom doodler. Follow her. She's wonderful. She's wonderful. Uh, if you want to communicate with us in any, any way, you can email us at subvertedtropecast at gmail, or you can find us on Twitter at Subverted Tropes. Um, we are working on being more engaged with the various medias. Indeed. Um, and don't forget to check out our blog where we try to post. We try, I feel like the more often I say we try to post with every episode, the less often we actually do it. Yes. Um, we will be posting with this one. We try to post with every episode with our sources and whatever fun stuff we've got going on. There's usually cute pictures of producer Ripley. That is subvertedtropecast.wordpress.com. Indeed. And uh, we are... Excited about our next episodes. We've got a schedule set up, a tentative schedule through the end of April. Uh, but if you want to suggest movies for us to talk about for the rest of the year, send us an email at uh, subvertedtropecast dot uh, at gmail dot com. What? I said the email. I know. I'm just saying. Say send us an email. email. And uh, I was just repeating it for you know. Gravitas. Gr- sure. Uh, <laughs> but no, send us an email and let us know what you'd love to hear from us. Uh, if you've got any you know, ways you think we could make the show better, uh, let us know that, too. We're mm-hmm. always open to constructive criticism. Yeah, just don't be a jag about it. Yeah. I'm sorry that we don't know about kaiju lore. I'm not sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, so that is going to be it for us. Uh, so, again, welcome to 2018. Uh, we're very excited to uh, have you guys along with us for this ride. Thanks, guys. Have a good one. Bye. <laughs>